Amen to that. John chapter 19. I appreciate y'all coming. Uh, everybody, this is Heather. Uh, she stopped by today and uh, said she would come to church tonight. And lo and behold, here she is. So you make her feel at home. All right. And um, I, it is Heather, right? I, I, okay. Because usually in a matter of three seconds, I forget the name you just told me. Uh, that's no kidding, too. I forget names very easily. All right, John chapter 19. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I could use some prayer, and our family could use some prayer. I'm telling you. Um, on top of uh, Alicia uh, having whatever's going on with her, uh, now Michaela has some problems, and um, it's really got, it's really a heavy, heavy burden. It's, and it's not just on uh alicia and michael and michaela it's it's on our family it's on the people in the church where we want to help carry this burden for them it's the right thing to do but um just pray for pray for their family all right uh, especially this time of year it's, it isn't like there's nothing else to do now you know uh, this is mail out week so on top of everything else that you do at christmas time we have uh, the packets uh, need to go out and um, so anyway, they could just use some prayer. And on top of it, I could use some prayer along with them. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Remember what we sang a while ago is grace is sufficient. And we're going to sing and, and we're going to talk about the wonderful words of life. And if those don't mean anything to us, then we need to leave here and go someplace else. But they to us, they mean what they mean. Father in heaven, we come before you tonight. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for... Uh, the opportunities that you have given me throughout my life uh, to see places, to be with people uh, from all over the country and then all over the world. And Father, I just, I thank you for that. And I, From the bottom of my heart, I thank you for that. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for watching over me and for giving me the grace that I have needed all of these years. You've been, you have supplied the grace that has always carried me, my wife, my family, my church. You've carried us through the hardest of days with your amazing grace. And Father, we thank you for that. We do not deserve it. We have not earned it and never will. But Father, that's what grace is all about. It is unmerited favor given to us by an all-loving God. And Father, we thank you for being that kind of God to us. We thank you for being our Father and for loving us the way a father loves his children, the way a father loves his grandchildren. And we ask you, God, Lord, that you would just put us in your favor tonight as you spoke through Paul and told us what to avoid, that we couldn't be hooked into this world and we couldn't be worldly and we couldn't have the things of this world and desire the things of this world and yet desire to be with you as well. And so, Father, you promised us that if we would choose you and choose your ways, Lord, that you would be our father and you would let us be your sons and daughters. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We ask you, God, to uh, show us your favor tonight and opening up your word to us and giving us understanding. Father, I thank you, Lord, for uh, the lesson that you have prepared for us. I thank you, Lord, for the prophecies yet again. Those old prophecies, thousands of years old, uh, coming to pass in the person of Jesus Christ exactly the way that you predicted it. And so, Father, Lord, open our eyes. Give us joy tonight as we study your word. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, I didn't hit a button that I shouldn't have hit. John chapter 19. Uh, let's roll back a little bit from what's on the screen. Um, in um, Let's go to verse, oh, let's see here. Let's go to verse 28 of uh, John 19. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things, there's, there's my favorite phrase, all things. Okay, not on the screen, I'm reading back a little bit. Um, all things were now accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith I thirst. I like that phrase, all things. It's in the Bible 220 times. It's a number for revelation. All things. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And so many other rich verses that just have this 
simple little phrase, all things, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. In other words, Jesus, even though he's suffering on the cross, even though he's been beaten mercilessly, uh, he's been scourged, he's been beaten in the face, he's had the hairs of his beard plucked out, uh, he's had the crown of thorns driven into his skull, and he's, he's got everybody hating him, and he has the, the knowledge then to understand that everything that needed to be accomplished up till that point has now been accomplished. And it says um, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith I thirst. So there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. Verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Three words uh, that bring death uh, from the mouth who spoke three words to Lazarus that gave him life. Isn't that something? Jesus, Jesus' mouth, Jesus' word, not only declares life, it declares death. Uh, and that's something that people like Joyce Myers and Joel Osteen, these people, they will never understand that because of the witchcraft that they're involved in. They will never, ever comprehend that Christ's word, the Bible is full of blessings and cursings. Blessings to those whom God gives blessings and who he has grace on, cursing to those who violate and break God's law and break God's commandments. It's full of both. And the Bible says choose. Blessings or cursings. Which one do you want? So the word, this, the same word that he said, Lazarus come forth. Same mouth he says, Lazarus come forth. Same mouth he says, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now verse 31, which is what I have up on the screen. The Jews therefore... Because it was the preparation. What was the preparation for? Passover. Okay, and so, lo and behold, here we have the Passover lamb. Being prepared right in front of their eyes. Most of them cannot see it. They're looking right at the lamb. They, can't, they heard his words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They had no idea what he said. They didn't understand what he said. I, I didn't really cover that. I was more interested in the, in the prophecy of what Jesus said. Uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in Psalm 22, you have things like, they pierce my hands and feet. They part my garments and cast lot. I didn't really get into this issue of, and it's not in John, it's in the other gospels, that what Jesus said on the cross all of those Jews are going, what did he say? And some said, oh, he's calling for Elijah, Elias. They had no idea that he was saying, my God, my that he's quoting Psalm 22. Had they known it, they might have repented. In fact, let me show you that. Turn to, um, turn to Isaiah 28. Remember in Isaiah 28, the, the word and to whom God uh, shows doctrine to is to those who read here a little and there a little. And what that means is you hear, read a little bit in the Old Testament, read a little bit in the New Testament. And all of a sudden you, it clicks together. Uh, no one of these seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. And so in uh, Isaiah 28, verse uh, 11, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Verse 12, To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is refreshing, yet they would not hear. In other words, and Paul uses this, I think, in Hebrews. And he's, and he's saying Israel had their rest. Right in front of them. Their Sabbath was right in front of them. Jesus is their Sabbath. He's our Sabbath. He's our rest. Um, they had their Sabbath, their rest, their refreshing right in front of them. But they, they would not hear. 
Verse 13, but the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. That phrase, fall backward. Uh, I was tempted to go to a church where they fell backward. God didn't let me fall backward. Amen. I did trip on the way out to the car that night, but <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. They would not hear the word of God, and so it comes out to them confusing. And they don't, they don't listen to what Jesus is saying and remember in their hearts that he's quoting Psalm 22, because then they would have seen, oh, look, they've pierced his hands and feet. Oh, look, they parted his garments and cast lots for his vesture. This must be the Messiah. But because they would not hear it, because they would not put the things together, uh, they're broken and they're snared and they're taken. And so their doom is more or less sealed. Now back in uh, John 19, 31, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, because it was the Passover, uh, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. The Jews, knowing that uh, we can't leave these men on the cross once the sun goes down, we're going to have to... Uh, we're going to have to uh, hasten, if you want to call it that, their death. And so with the way that they're being killed is slowly, torturously um, suffocating uh, on their own uh, bodily fluids, literally suffocating, drowning in their own fluids. Um, they were going to come and break their legs so that they could no longer push up with their legs and give ease to their lungs. And so, verse 32, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. They were still alive. Which I think is interesting. I never really thought of this before until just now. The Bible speaks of Christ being the, the, like the first fruits of them uh, that have died or something like that. I'm not quoting the verse just right. But it's like he was the first one to take, to go through death's door. Being uh, the first fruits of God, being the firstborn, uh, and so on. I wish I could remember that verse now that, uh, that I'm thinking of it. Uh, but anyway, it's interesting to me that Christ died first before the other two. They're still alive. But he, when they get to Jesus, verse 33... When they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. I believe that they went in right here through the, maybe the fifth rib. That's mentioned a couple times in the scriptures. And that spear pierced through. The pericardium, which at that time would have been bloated with water and piercing through that so that what, what they see, verse 34, one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. Not just blood, not just water, blood and water. Verse 35, and I, I got a place now, another place that didn't come to me while I was putting my notes together, but it's... Knocking the door of my brain now. Verse 35, and he saw he that saw it bear record. That is one of John's signature phrases. Is that he bear record. Bear record, bear record. Uh, what does he say in 1 John 5, 7? For there are three that what? Play records. <laughs> oh, bear record. I got it, okay. There are three that bear record. Father, Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There, there are three that bear record in the earth, the Spirit, and what? Let's go look at 1 John 5. 1 John 5. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 
3 John, Jude, and Revelation. Um, 1 John 5. Look at verse 7. Thank you very much. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And then there are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. So how many, how many do you have total that agree? I don't know what it means, but it's interesting. Six. Father, the Word, Holy Ghost in heaven and on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Um, but you basically you have an agreement between heaven and earth, which is not doesn't happen often. But that's what was in the prayer that Jesus uh, gave to us a model to pray after uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so with Christ being pierced at Cal Calvary and with his sacrifice heaven and earth now are in agreement there, there's no uh, there's no fighting anymore for those who believe and those who trust in the record and the witness that all of these bring forward the the father the word the holy ghost and i like it that john says the word instead of the son i'm not trying to correct god but if I need help in understanding what heaven's got to say, I know where to go to find it. It's in the Word. Amen. And listen, I, you know, I, I, some days I spend looking at how other people believe, how other preachers are guiding their ministries, and I am, I'm just beyond amazed anymore when I see yet another preacher steering or some some online guru i'll call them that because i don't think some of these people are even saved so i know they're not preachers and they've not they've not been called they've not been uh ordained of god to preach the gospel because if they would they would steer people toward the word of god but they are steering people away from the word of god uh here lately i mentioned this guy named mark verkler and he's he says that he's been that he spent all this time as a Christian now, but he could never hear from God. What church? What what religion do you have where you don't hear from God? Every one of them except Bible Christianity. Okay? You don't you gotta hear from God. And he said, I spent all these years not hearing from God. And I don't I don't know where he learned it. I know he didn't come up with it on his own. That much I know. Because this guy says that God showed him that he's to get alone in the morning and he's to meditate, empty his mind, make a space for God. And uh, they call it uh, mindfulness. But it's the opposite of that. It is, it is you being mindful of one thing. They say focus on your breath. Everybody else is. Focus on your breathing. Say a word from the Bible and repeat it. Focus on that. That's called mindfulness to them. But basically, it's it's nothing more than uh, Engl uh, uh, Eastern mysticism, meditation, transcendental meditation. So he goes into this trance and he says, the first thing that flashes into your head, write it down. That's God. How do you know? Because it came suddenly. And so you write it down. And he's misusing scriptures. I think he talks about how when Christ is going to come again, he's going to come suddenly. Well, he's misusing scriptures. So he says the first thing that pops into your mind suddenly, you write that down. And he says that is God's word for you that day. You follow that. And that he calls hearing from God. I don't need it. In fact, I wouldn't trust. What, how many times, John, and be careful how you answer this question. How many times have you heard me sitting there, you sitting there, how many times have you heard me be wrong? Be careful now. I'm just kidding. More than once, right? All right, that's careful. Uh, I've been wrong 
But I, I just, I like it that God put here, those that bear record in heaven are the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost. And by the way, that is John too. The Word, the Word, the Word. My friend from Bible college, about the only guy I have any contact with after Bible college, and he's a good guy, good preacher. Um, he was told, uh, because he, he always argued for 1 John 5, 7 being in the Bible. And he went to uh, Southwestern Theological Seminary, which is a Southern Baptist college. And um, he was taught by a professor. He, he, I can remember him chuckling and laughing when this came to his mind. He was telling me that he had a professor during his doctorate courses that said, basically, if it sounds like John, it probably isn't John. And he just laughed. I, I could hear him now just laughing and chuckling. And a little, he was a cute guy. He really was. Better looking than me. And he would have this nice little, cute little laugh. And he just laughed at that. And he said, they're basically saying, if it sounds like John, it's not John. And I'm going, no, it is. They called him, John called him the word. John said, bear record, bear witness, and so on. Anyway, back to John 19. And I want to get to this legs broken thing, because that was a fulfillment of prophecy. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 32, then the soldiers came and, and break the legs of the first and the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record and his record is true. There it is again, bear record. His record is true. And he knoweth that he saith, and he knoweth that he saith true that you might believe. I mean, we have to have the truth or we can't believe. If it's not the truth, we can't believe it. Verse 36, for these things were done. Why? That the scripture should be fulfilled. What is here again, we're learning what is absolutely important to God. What's important to God is the truth of the scriptures. That's What's important to God? Christ not getting his legs broken on the cross was for the... I mean, God could have picked anything that would have happened on that day. But he chose the fact that they didn't break his legs, having it written thousands of years before Christ came. It's not just in the Psalms either. It's beyond that, I found out. That the scripture might should be fulfilled so that you and I coming now 2,000 years after the crucifixion of Christ. We can absolutely believe that the scriptures were not only true when Jesus was alive. They're true now. In fact, I believe that they are absolutely more essential now than they ever have been. Because now they're talking about the end of the world and what's coming. That the scriptures should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture said, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. Let's look at these verses. Turn to Psalm 34. And I'm going to ask you to turn there so that um, you can make a note in your Bible that this is this fulfills John chapter 19, verse uh, 33 and 34. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And I've included the, the scriptures before and after. Because I, I like to not only see what scripture was fulfilled, but what's, what else is being said in that, in that context. So in verse 18, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And save the such as be of a contrite spirit. When I see somebody arrogant, um, prideful, um, boasting all the time of what they do, boasting all the time of how they live, boasting all the time against other people, saying, they live like this and they don't do what I do. I do things that are right and they boast and they brag. 
and they're bloated beyond comprehension. Uh, God doesn't save those people. He doesn't save people who are not of a contrite spirit. How does God, uh, how does God make us humble? By humiliating us. He lets people find out things that we do. He humiliates us and that breaks us down. Because we don't want anybody to know our secrets. We don't want anybody to know our secret sins, our faults. We don't want anybody to know that. We only want them to see the things that we do good. But God brings them down and he will save those who are of a contrite spirit. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. And you think upon that. Uh, because, I mean, once again, we've got, we've got families. Uh, and I don't, I don't want to just focus on mine. I mean, we've been praying for David. Um, that God will bless him, that God will give him healing, or that God will give him grace. Um, and if God gives him grace and doesn't heal him, then so be it. If God heals him, he's still going to give him grace. And he's going to praise the Lord anyway. Amen? Uh, but there are other families that are, that are suffering too. But that's what's going to happen in this life. Is that we who try to live the life that we're called to live, we are going to be afflicted. We're going to be beaten. We're going to be sick. We're going to get diseases. We're going to have problems in our body. We're going to have problems in our mind. Those things are going to happen. So, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Amen. Now, I believe that. But the question is, when? When does God deliver him out of them all? Maybe at his coming. So be it. Doesn't matter. I win. If I've got afflictions and I don't like how I am and I don't like what's going on with me and I don't like what's going on here or here or anywhere else, God will deliver me. And if he waits until he comes, so be it. Verse 20, he keepeth, he keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. So if Christ can work again this is david writing a thousand plus years before the life of christ and he is spot on once again i mean he, uh, it's, i told you about shooting that arrow and he hit the target again a thousand years later right in the bullseye while bill hickok couldn't shoot that good amen he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil, evil shall slay the wicked. And they that hate righteous, hate the righteous shall be desolate. Now listen, this world's getting pretty crummy. It's getting pretty disgusting. It's getting pretty sick. I'm sick and tired of all of the wicked people not getting what they deserve. I'm sick and tired of corrupt politicians, corrupt people, corrupt businessmen, corrupt neighbors, corrupt churches, corrupt preachers, corrupt pew members. I'm sick and tired of all of it. But all I have to do is wait. Because their own evil will slay them. The Bible, David talks about it in the Psalms. He said this, the, the snare or the trap or the whatever that they laid out for me. They fall into. And they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. I like that. And I like, like I say, he keepeth all of his bones. And I like what's written around it. Now, go to uh, Exodus 12. Turn there. Exodus 12. Verse 46. What is it speaking of? What would be in Exodus 12? Passover. Passover. Here we are at Passover. And God made a commandment concerning Passover. He said in verse 46, In one house shall it be eaten. In other words, 
One lamb per house. Once they are, once the lamb has been slain and it's been divvied up, you don't take the leftovers to your neighbor and give it to them. One lamb, one house. One house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. It doesn't leave the house. They had to eat all of it. And neither shall you break a bone thereof. So this is Moses. This is, uh, let's see, Abraham. It's about 3,000, uh, yeah. About 2,000 years, somewhere around in there. No, that, that brings you to Abraham. Abraham to Christ is 2,000 years. So let's say maybe 1,500 years. Uh, thereabouts. When God gave this commandment. And look in Numbers chapter 9. The Bible says in the Lord, uh, verse 9, Numbers 9, verse 9, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, if, a, if any man of you or of your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord, the 14th day of the second month. I like this uh, because a lot of people don't know that there were two Passovers. And uh, here's what I think that that means. Those who could not, you listen to this now, those who could not, by law, participate in the first Passover, which was Christ, God has prepared a second one. Now, it's not going to be killing Christ again, okay, which is done by our Catholic neighbors over here a dozen times a day every day. Uh, Heather told me that today, said she went to the Catholic church, but she said, I'm not Catholic. So she decided to come to us tonight. Uh, every time they say a mass, they believe that they're crucifying Jesus all over again. That's, that is so wrong. But anyway, so now we have a second chance for Jewish people to have the blessing of Passover. 14th day of the second month. At even, they shall keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and what kind of herbs? Bitter herbs. Why? Because it represents death and death is bitter. Uh, think of the vinegar that was given to Jesus. And they shall leave none of it unto the morning, same rule, nor break any bone of it. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. And so, I believe somehow, some way, I don't know exactly how it's going to be done. But somehow, some way, the people of Israel who were unclean, defiled by, what was it they were defiled by, John? A dead body. Dead body. Their own, I would say. But they're defiled. They couldn't keep the first Passover. They're not qualified. And yet, there's going to be a second one. A big sacrifice. Okay? And um, God's going to offer them salvation once again. And Zechariah chapter 12 uh, is the prophecy of the, um, where, they, where John said, They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Turn to Zechariah chapter 12 verse 9. And that way you can write John chapter 19 verse 33 and 34. Uh, he had to be pierced. Um, I don't. I don't know. I, I. I haven't really studied this. I've always thought, though. I guess because of the various paintings that we see, we know uh, or we think that the two thieves that were crucified on Jesus' side. Does anybody recall how they were attached to the cross? The two thieves that were on Jesus' side, does anybody recall how they were attached to the cross? The, the Bible? No, that was, uh, that was a story uh, relating to Peter. Um, in every depiction I've seen, they were tied. Do what? Yeah. That, now, I don't know um, if that was how crucifixion was done commonly by tying them up with ropes. We just know 
that there's something peculiar about Jesus' crucifixion that sets him apart from the others in that he's pierced, hands and his feet, and he's pierced in his side. And we know that Jesus used that when he appears to the disciples and there's Thomas who has already told the other disciples, unless I uh, see the wound in his side, unless I put my finger through the holes in his hands and his feet, I won't believe. And there's Jesus showing up going. Oh, Thomas, I got holes here for you. Um, I don't think it was like that. But anyway, uh, that, I think that set Jesus' crucifixion apart. So, Zechariah 12, 9, It shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Now, that has not been fulfilled yet. So, is it a false prophecy? It's going to be fulfilled. Thank you. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. So, you know, supplications are what we pray. We pray and we and supplications are the things that we ask for in prayer. Notice this. If you, if you wonder about what praying in the spirit is, praying in the spirit is simply the spirit leading you as you pray and you pray what is what is uh, what did paul say for we know not what to pray for as we ought but the spirit itself helpeth our infirmities with groanings which cannot be uttered so someone who is praying like john said he was in the spirit on the lord's day uh, i believe he was in prayer and i believe that the holy ghost was leading him on the things to pray for. Who knows? John may have been praying. Oh, I'd really like to see Jesus today. I miss him. And he turns and looks. And there he I mean, he may, that may have been it. I don't know. But anyway, the spirit of grace and supplications. So the spirit will lead you by God's grace into what to pray for. Because we don't know what to pray for. And then he said, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now, obviously, Zechariah does not fulfill this scripture. And you remember when uh, Philip was uh, called out to go and meet the Ethiopian eunuch. When he gets into the chariot with him, uh, he, Philip finds that he's reading Isaiah 53. And the eunuch asked Philip, saith he these things of himself or some other? In other words, was Isaiah talking about himself in Isaiah 53 that, uh, that uh, by his stripes were healed and so on? And Philip then had the perfect opportunity to start right there and lead that man to believing in Jesus Christ. And let me just share something with you. Uh, when it comes to Trying to witness to people. I know that it's not the easiest thing in the world to just walk up to somebody and do. Okay, I get it. Or, and I'll say this. I would say it's even harder to do with family members. Because, I mean, you don't want to fall out of fellowship with your family. Well, we're we're t we're talking about people who are not who are not born again. They're not saved, and it is very difficult to witness to them. Except God pours out a spirit of grace on you, and now you can speak. You can say just the right words, and I've had that happen before. I was working with a guy one time, James, and I liked James. We got along really well. I could always tell when James lit up a cigarette in the house because he smoked those menthol ones. And I mean instantly menthol is going across my nose. But James and I were painting in the same big room one day. And the Lord was laying it on my heart. Talk to James about 
the Lord and about church. And I, in my heart, I said, I will, Lord. I'm rolling. And about 15 minutes later, the Lord said, uh, now. Mm -hmm. Oh, because I forgot. I said, James, why don't you come to church Sunday? And he put his roller down. He looked at me and he said, you know, I was just standing there thinking of that very thing when you said that. And I was just like, doodads. And we talked for about 15 minutes. Um, he never came to church after that. I never, you know, it wasn't too long and I wasn't working with him. I would see his wife at the gas station sometimes in the morning and say, tell James, I said, hey, and come to church and so on. But I've never seen him. But who knows, he may just pop in the door one Sunday. That would tickle me to death. Uh, James was a good guy, but he needed to be saved. And uh, the Lord, I promise you, when it's time, the Lord will give you the words to say. And they'll be the right words. Uh, but anyway, the spirit of grace and supplication, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only... So look at that. So it's not Zechariah. It's not Isaiah. It's Jesus Christ. As they mourn for their only son and shall be in bitterness for him. As one that is in bitterness for his... Which born? First born. That's Jesus. Okay. A fulfillment... Not only of, of them piercing Christ and all the people seeing him pierced. But the fact that he was the firstborn of Mary. And the fact that Mary and Joseph, although they were betrothed to each other, they were, in, they were legally engaged. And that was as binding as a marriage. They had not been together yet. And so now Mary's fulfilling all kinds of prophecies. The fact that she's a virgin, the fact that this is her firstborn son, and it fulfills this, and it fulfills parts of the law. And I mean, it just, it's just one, uh, one domino after another of prophecies that are just falling. They're just coming into place. I mean, it's just like, it's just like God saw everything happen already. And he said, hey, Zechariah, write this down. Trust me. It's going to happen exactly this way. So, um, uh, we'll deal with this next Wednesday night. Um, because this deals with... I've had people ask me this question, Steve. Pastor Mike, do you think or when do you think the church will have to go underground? I'll be honest with you, I don't. I don't. I'm not making any plans of hiding who I am, what I am. This is not just a secondary part of my life that I live on weekends. Uh, this is who I am. It's what Number one, God has chosen for me. It's what I've chosen for myself. And I don't plan on hiding in the cave somewhere while people that I know are going to hell. And if it costs us our lives, it wasn't our life. Just remember that. It's not your life, okay? It's God's. He can do with it as he pleases. Amen.